Greetings, everybody. This is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This is going to be part six of Day of the Lord versus Day of Christ. We're doing the Day of the Lord first. Get your King James Bibles and turn it to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 13. The book of Jeremiah, well, Ezekiel, and Isaiah are severely neglected books of the Bible, as is the entire New Te uh, Old Testament and the Minor Prophets. This Bible study is going to lean, lead up to the book of Joel. So, let's get out and read Ezekiel chapter 13. I've covered this in a previous study. I don't remember where it's at. I have over 800 studies at present on YouTube. And honestly, I've got a decent memory, but it's not that good. So, all right, let's take a look at... Ezekiel chapter 13, verse 1. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel that prophesy, and say thou unto them that prophesy out of their own hearts, Hear ye the word of the Lord. See, they were they're prophets, but they're not doing the Lord's work. They're prophesying out of their own hearts. Well, what does the Bible say about our hearts? You know, you've always heard people say, Oh, follow your heart in all things. Well, in Jeremiah 17 and verse 9, the prophet Jeremiah says, The heart is deceitful above all all things, and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Well, the answer to that is the Lord. All right, let's go back to Isaiah, I'm sorry, Ezekiel chapter 13, and starting in a, uh, go, we're going to go on to first three. Thus saith the Lord God, Woe! unto the foolish prophets that follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. So you got wise prophets that follow the Lord, and then you got foolish prophets that follow their own spirit who've seen nothing. Verse 4, O Israel, Thy prophets are like the foxes in the deserts. Ye have not gone up into the gaps, neither made up the hedge for the house of Israel to stand in the battle in the day of the Lord. Now there's a lot of meat in this. Standing in the gap is a military term. When you have two armies facing each other, you want to face the enemy forward. And if there was a break in the in the line, they call they call it a gap. And what would happen is troops would pour into the gap. So then your battle line, you have people facing the army in front. You've got an enemy to your side. And then you've got an enemy to your rear. You're fighting an enemy from three sides. That is bad news. Really bad news. Let's take a look. I mean, you don't you don't you don't want to be fighting an enemy from three sides. I mean, it's difficult enough to fight him from you know just 
facing and facing them. So let's take a look. All right. Uh, let's go to the book of Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to take a look at the armor of God. This is how a soldier of the Lord is supposed to be able to fight. Verse 11. Ephesians 6, verse 11. It says, put on the whole armor of God. Now, what's armor? It's, you know, in the old times, it was, uh, you've heard of knights in shining armor? Well, that was to protect them against sword attacks and arrows and what have you. So it says, put on the whole armor of God. Did you know God provides us with armor? He does. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Well, actually, we do wrestle against flesh and blood, but, but it's not just flesh and blood. But there's a power behind the flesh and blood. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. How come every time I read this, I think of Washington, D.C.? Wherefore, take on you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. We're not supposed to lay down. We're not supposed to sit. We're supposed to stand. Verse 14. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Do you know the Bible says that without righteousness we won't see God? I think I'm paraphrasing that, but... In Genesis chapter 15 and verse 6, it says, And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. Believing in faith is the same thing, okay? And I believe this was talking about Abraham. So having faith and belief is counted unto us for righteousness. Boy, I could do a sermon. Well, not a sermon, but a, a Bible study on just uh, righteousness here. In Matthew 5.20, Jesus speaking, he said, For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of of the scribes and Pharisees, he shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Well, who were the scribes and Pharisees? They were the Jews. The scribes were the Jewish copyists of the of the of the of the law, and the Pharisees they were a denomination of Jews. So Jesus told his those that believed on him that if their righteousness didn't exceed that of the Jews. They would not enter into the kingdom of heaven. How's that for uh, something, you know? Read what Paul says about righteousness in Romans chapter 1, starting in verse 15. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome... Also, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to every one that believeth. Hmm. The gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to every one that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed 
from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. This is going to happen one day. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Boy, that's a mouthful there. So, all right, Romans 4, verse 1. What shall we say then that Abraham, our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? That's quoting what we just read uh, previously in, in Genesis. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God. And it was counted unto him for righteousness. Romans 5.21 That as sin, sin, hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ, our Lord. And when we talk about rain, we're not talking about water coming down from the sky. We're talking about a, a king reigning upon the throne. Even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ, our Lord. How could anybody read this and then deny that Paul was called of the Lord. I just, I don't, well, that, we're not fighting against flesh and blood. We're fighting against uh, spiritual wickedness in high places, right? All right, Hebrews 12, 14. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Our righteousness creates holiness. Well, right our righteousness in Christ. We have no righteousness or holiness in the flesh, that's for sure. So let's go back to Ephesians chapter 6. All right, verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Did you notice there's nothing protecting your back? So if an enemy gets behind you and you're not facing the enemy, you have no protection, which is why it was so important not to, to have somebody stand in the gap. All right, let's go back to Ezekiel chapter 13. Verse 5, ye have not gone up into the gaps, neither made up the hedge for the house of Israel to stand in the battle in the day of the Lord. I did an entire study on the hedge of protection. 
I mean, let's face it, a hedge is like a fence, but it's a living plant. Some people plant a hedge of thorns, and which is even better than a fence when it gets large and thick. So the foolish prophets, they didn't stand in the gap. They didn't make up a hedge. They didn't want to protect the children of Israel in the day of the Lord and the battle. They didn't have righteousness. They didn't have holiness. They were preaching what they wanted to preach out of their own heart. Not a good thing. Verse 6. They have seen vanity. What's vanity? It's something that's worthless. They have seen vanity and lying, lying, as in lies and liars, and lying, divination. Do you know what the word divination means? You've heard of a divining rod? Well, it comes from the root word divine, as in, you know, God is divine, but it has an occult theme to it. People divine evil spirits, ghosts, devils. They have seen vanity and lying divination, saying, the Lord saith, and the Lord hath not sent them. See, they were speaking in the name of the Lord, but he didn't send them. And they have made others to hope that they would confirm the word. Not the word of God, their word. Have not yet ye, uh, have ye not seen a vain vision? And have ye not spoken a lying divination? Whereas ye say, the Lord said it, I'm sorry, the Lord saith it, albeit I have not spoken. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, behold, because ye have spoken vanity and seen lies, therefore, behold, I am against you, saith the Lord God. Verse 9. All right, verse 9. Here's where the Lord gets serious. And mine hand shall be upon the prophets that see vanity that and that divine lies. They shall not, they shall not be in the assembly of my people. Neither shall they be written in the writing of, of the house of Israel. People, I think that's the book of life. I don't think their names are going to be written in the book of life. Neither shall they be written in the writing of the house of Israel. Neither shall they enter into the land of Israel. And ye shall know that I am the Lord God. Because, even because they have seduced my people. You know, being seduced has more than just a sexual connotation. You can seduce people spiritually. I mean, turn on, you want to see examples of that, turn on TBN. Because even because they have seduced my people saying, peace, and there was no peace, and one built up a wall, and lo, others daubed it with untempered mortar. In other words, they, they built a wall, but untempered mortar is just basically mud. It doesn't, it doesn't get hard and hold the wall in place. I mean, that's basically what it's saying. Oh yeah, they're, they're building a wall. But it's not going to last. It's not going to stand. 
Say unto them, say unto them which daub it with untempered mortar, that it shall fall. See, these people built up a wall, but it was for show to the people. Oh yeah, we're going to protect you with a wall. But the wall is going to fall. And there's not going to be any protection. Because these are lying, false prophets. Say, the, say unto them which daub it with untempered mortar, that it shall fall. There shall be an overflowing shower, and ye, O great hailstones, shall fall, and a stormy wind shall rend it. Do you know what it means to rend? It means it gets torn apart. So the Lord says he's going to rain down hailstones and destroy this wall with the untempered mortar. Let's take a look at some hailstones in the Bible. Now, you know, you could always pause this study and look up any chapters that I'm uh, reading from, and you could read the whole thing, just to prove that I'm not reading stuff out of context. So, in the book of Joshua, chapter 10 and verse 11, Israel's fighting against the Lord's enemies in the Promised Land, the Philistines and what have you, the Canaanites. Uh, it says, And it came to pass, as they fled from before Israel, and were in the going down to Beth Horon, that the Lord cast down great stones from heaven upon them unto Azekah, and they died. They were more which died with hailstones than they whom the children of Israel slew with the sword. So that's uh, pretty interesting, right? In the uh, book of Ezekiel, chapter 38, we read the following. Now, hailstones, huge hailstones in the end times. In the book of Revelation, they're mentioned. But uh, let's see, we're looking at Ezekiel 38 and verse 20. So that the fishes of the sea and the fowls of heaven and the beasts of the field and all creeping things that creep upon the earth and all men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. And the mountains shall be thrown down and the steep places shall fall and every wall Every wall shall fall to the ground. You know, this, these kind of stuff, all these verses tie in with the end times. You know, the, the Bible says in Revelation that there's, you know, the mountains are going to, there's going to be a great earthquake, the mountains are going to flood away, the mountains are going to be leveled, pretty much. Uh, verse 21, And I will call... For a sword against him throughout all my mountains, saith the Lord God, every man's sword shall be against his brother. And I will plead against him with pestilence. The Bible says that there's going to be a uh, plague that wipes out, I forget if it's a third or a quarter of humanity. And I will plead against him with pestilence and with blood, and I will rain upon him and upon his bands and upon the many people that are with him an ever overflowing rain and great hailstones. Fire and brimstone. Doesn't the Bible say that in the, uh, the when the Lord returns, he's going to uh, destroy everything with fire? So fire and brimstone. Thus will I magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations, and they shall know that I am the Lord. All right, let's take a look at uh, Isaiah chapter 30. It's got a lot of prophecy in it, but people don't want to read it, so they're lost. Uh, let's see. 
Isaiah chapter 30, verse 28. And his breath as an overflowing stream shall reach to the midst of the neck to sift the nations with the sieve, sieve, I'm sorry, the sieve of vanity. And there shall be a bridle in the jaws of the people, causing them to err. He shall have a song as in the night when a holum solemnity, solemnity is kept, and gladness of heart, as when one goeth with a pipe to come into the mountain of the Lord, to the mighty one of Israel. And the Lord shall cause his glorious voice to be heard, and shall show the lightning down of his arm, with the indignation of his anger, the indignation of his anger, and with the flame, the flame of a devouring fire, with scattering and tempest, and hailstones. You know, when Israel was in Egypt, God rained down hail uh, as a plague against Egypt. I mean, it almost wiped out. It basically wiped out all the crops. And what, whatever the hail didn't destroy, the worms basically ate and destroyed. And, you know, so it's a lot of stuff. All right, let's take a look. Uh, let's see. Revelation chapter 8 and verse 7. The first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood. Didn't we just read this in Isaiah? The first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of trees were burnt up, and all green grass was burnt up. Revelation 11:19, And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings. Didn't we just read that in Ezekiel 13? Yeah. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. Revelation 16:21. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. And I'm not sure what a talent weighs, but we'll, we can look it up. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. A talent is between 25 to 30 kilograms or between 55 to 70 pounds. Can you imagine a 50-pound a piece of hail flying down out of the sky and smacking you in the head? You're dead. You know, 50 pounds is bad enough, but 70 pounds? Forget about it. All right, so there's going to be some. Um... Oh, I see why the wall falls down. Yeah, you get wall gets hit with a 70 pound piece of uh, hail. It's going to fall. All right. All right. We're going back to Ezekiel chapter 13. Verse 11. Send to them with which daub it with untempered mortar. That's that's mortar that doesn't set people. You know, it's just like mud. It just, it never gets hard. It doesn't hold anything in place. Say unto them which daub it with untempered mortar, that it shall fall. There shall be an overflowing shower, and ye, O great hailstone, shall fall, and a stormy wind shall rend, uh, shall rend it. And they're talking about the uh, prophets that build the wall, right? Lo, when the wall is fallen, shall it not be said unto you, where is the daubing where, wherewith ye have daubed it? Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, I will rend it with a stormy wind in my fury, and there shall be an overflowing shower in mine anger, and great hailstones in my fury to consume it. So will I break down the wall that ye have daubed with untempered mortar, and bring it down to the ground, so that the foundation thereof shall be discovered, and it shall fall, and ye shall be consumed in the midst thereof, 
and ye shall know that I am the Lord. You know, it'd be pretty uh, something. You know, it says that they're going to be consumed in the midst thereof. Well, what happens if you try to hide behind this wall with untempered mortar, and there's 70 pound hailstones flying down at, you know, 90 miles an hour? I mean, it just, it's going to fall on top of you and you're dead, right? Verse 15 Thus will I accomplish my wrath upon the wall. And upon them that have daubed it with untempered mortar, and will say unto you, The wall is no more, neither they that daubed it. To wit, the prophets of Israel, which prophesy concerning Jerusalem. Now, sometimes in a, the Bible, there's talking about something present time, and then it alludes to the future. Okay? Jerusalem's been destroyed a couple of times. Matter of fact, the Babylonians destroyed it one time. And then the Romans came and destroyed it another time. And you know what's interesting is when the Romans and the Babylonians came and destroyed Jerusalem, it was the same exact day. Coincidence? I don't think so. I think the Lord was telling trying to tell the Jews something. But of course, they're not going to listen. To it, the prophets of Israel, oh, and, and it, Jerusalem's going to be destroyed again in the future. Maybe on the same day again, I don't know. To it, the prophets of Israel, which prophesy, prophesy concerning Jerusalem, and which see visions of peace for her, and there is no peace saith the Lord God. Likewise, thou son of man, set thy face, set thy face against the daughters of thy people, which prophesy out of their own heart, and prophesy thou against them. And say, thus saith the Lord God, Woe to the women that sow pillows to all armholes, I wish I could tell you what this means. I have no idea. Woe to the women that sew pillows to all armholes and make kerchiefs upon the head of every stature to hunt souls. Will ye hunt the souls of my people? And will ye save the souls alive that come unto you? And will ye pollute me among my people for the handfuls of barley and for pieces of bread to slay the souls that should not die and to save the souls alive that should not live? In other words, they were killing the righteous and saving the wicked. And believe me, people, the Bible tells you there are certain capital crimes that God commanded death for. And Christians should demand that those capital crimes, that the sentence be carried out by the government against those wicked. It's like murder. You know, you get a guy that's a murderer. I'm not talking about an accident. I'm talking about somebody that goes out and hunts people to kill them. You don't, you know, it's absolutely foolish to let a lawyer get a, the, the, a case, a uh, murder thing thrown out of court because of some stupid little technicality. The Bible was very clear. If there was two or three witnesses to a murder, a person was to be put to death. Not put in a warehouse called a jail. And, uh, you know, and then say, well, you know, he served 10 years in prison with good behavior, so we're going to let him out. And as soon as he gets out, he kills again. Uh, I don't think so. That's not what the Lord commanded. You know, there were cases of capital. And a lot of Christians do not understand this. But the Bible commanded Satanists be put to death because what do they do? They kidnap and kill children 
and other people as offerings to the devils. They do this. And uh, eventually, when their power is complete and the Lord gets tired of it, he's going to let them kill the Christians. He's going to let them kill the Christians. The Christians don't know it. In America, they have no idea. Very few Christians have an understanding, and they're not going to understand. You know, they expect they're going to fly away any second. No, they're not going to fly away. God's going to let the Satanists, you know, God's going to, God's at the point where it's like, oh, you, you Christians don't want to have Christ as king. You don't want to have my laws for the laws of your government. Fine. You can have Satan as your king and his laws. And we're going to let you see how you like it. And the Christians are going to be shocked. They're going to be shocked. And will ye pollute me among my people for handfuls of barley and for pieces of bread to slay the souls that should not die? And to save the souls alive that should not live by your lying to my people that hear your lies? Wherefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against your pillows, wherewith ye there hunt the souls of, to make them fly. And I will tear them from your arms, and will let the souls go, even the souls that ye hunt, to make them fly. I wonder if uh, that's the pre-trib rapture. Verse 21, Your kerchiefs also will I tear and deliver my people out of your hand, and they shall be no more in your hand to be hunted. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. Because with lies, lies, ye have made the heart of the righteous sad, whom I have not made sad, and strengthen the hands of the wicked, that he should not return from his wicked way by promising him life. Oh, yeah. that's the, There's a couple ways of, of looking at this. One, uh, like wicked murderers, they should die. The Bible clearly says murderers should be put to death. The Bible says witches and saucers should be put to death. But we don't do that anymore. You know, oh, well, you know, you get some kosher lawyer and says, well, you know, criminal uh, uh, capital punishment is just, you know, it's not a deterrent and, and it's cruel, to, an unusual punishment to put a murderer to death. So they get promised life. They get to live out their days in a warehouse they call a prison with color TV and cable and, uh, you know, uh, steak dinners and what have you, you know. But also, that's the physical life. What about a spiritual life? You ever listen to a church that says, all you got to do is believe in Jesus and you're, and you're saved? Well, you know, in the first and second chapters of John, or I'm sorry, James, first and second chapters of James, James said, faith without works is death is dead being alone. And you're not saved by your works, but your works are proof of what you believe, your faith. Your, you know, our works come from our faith. We're not saved by our works. And the Bible says, um, now let's read it. James chapter 2, verse 17. Even so faith if it hath not works, is dead being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God? Thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. See, even Satan believes in God, but his works are evil. 
So, you know, let's face it. Believing by it in and of itself means nothing. But what it's what you do with that faith. That's what's important. All right. So here it is. You got churches that tell people, just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you're going to be saved. Well, Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. I'm paraphrasing. But that's what Jesus told Nicodemus. We have to be born of the Spirit. I mean, like, us, like James says, even Satan believes in God, but he's not of the Spirit. Verse 23. Therefore, Ye shall see no more vanity, nor divine, nor divine divinations. For I will deliver my people out of your hand. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. All right, let's get ready to close this out. John chapter 10, verses 23 through 29. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Then came the Jews round about him. Remember, Jesus said, except your righteousness exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you're not going to see heaven. Remember that? Matter of fact, let's take a look at that again. All right, Matthew chapter 5, verses 18, we'll start. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. That's basically the crossing of the T and the dotting of the I's. Now, there were different laws. There were the, you know, the Ten Commandments, which were the moral laws, which were for everybody. Jesus condensed it to the Two Commandments. Love the Lord and love thy neighbor. Then you had the laws for the government, the king. That's the laws that said that the murderers should be put to death, sodomites should be put to death, witches and saucers should be put to death. And then you had the laws of blood sacrifice for the Levite priest, the Levitical priesthood. Those laws were the law the only laws that were actually nailed to the cross so one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled whosoever there shall uh, therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven but whosoever shall do and teach them the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you, now this is Jesus speaking. This isn't Bob. This is Jesus. For I say unto you, except that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. Now, the Pharisees are Jews, people. That except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. All right, let's go back to John chapter 10, verse 23. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and ye believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. And what works did Jesus do? Let's see. He healed the blind. He caused the uh, dumb to speak, the deaf to hear. He People who had withered hands, he made them healthy. He, he healed lepers. You know, the lame could walk. He raised the dead to life. 
were the Jews doing any of this stuff? No. And yet they didn't believe that he was of the Lord. No. Jesus answered them, I told you, and ye believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But ye believe not because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. But ye believe not because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. My sheep hear my voice. And I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Well, let's take a look at Romans chapter 10, verse 8. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we pre preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. Ooh, you see, believing on the Lord is righteousness, right? For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be shamed. And when's that? Uh, we're not going to be ashamed in the day of judgment. Romans 14, 17. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. See, Jesus wasn't joking around in Nicodemus when he told him, ye must be born again. He wasn't joking around. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. You know what reconciliation means? It means, uh, let's say, you and a family member have a fight. Time goes bad. Well, if you have reconciliation, it means you basically kissed and made up, you know. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. Yeah, that's right. You need to be reconciled with God. We all do. For he hath made him to be sin for us. Who? Christ. For he, God, hath made him, Christ, for he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness, the righteousness of God in him. See, that's the only way we're going to have righteousness in God, is through Christ. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 7, Be not ye therefore partakers with them. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. All right, well, that's going to be the end of part six of Day of the Lord and Ezekiel chapter 13. And all blessings, praise, glory, and honor to the Lamb of God, slain before the foundation of the world. And that's Jesus, who is the Christ, in his precious name. Amen.